Well, welcome once again. And those of you watching online, welcome to you too. Um, you're important to us. We even let you have an extra hour of sleep because we love you. And we wanted you to tune in and watch. You know, we, um, we plan these message series, oh, like six months ahead. And as only God can orchestrate, we've been working on this first message in this new series, 2020 Vision. And that same week, Pastor George was scheduled for his annual eye exam. So how's God's timing? George sees Dr. Heather Trapagan, and uh, she's part of Grace Church. And on that Friday, Heather and he uh, and their whole team did a, a thorough and professional job checking on George's vision. And she had him look into at least four different machines and went through a whole battery of questions. And then Dr. Heather and her staff dilated his eyes. And I don't know if any of you have ever left the doctor's office wearing those very stylish black glasses. But the Holy Spirit prompted George to ask Heather if she might be willing to shoot a, a video about vision, and even though she's an introvert, she agreed. And Thomas and Pastor Wes uh, visited her in her office a few days ago, and so here's some film then, so watch this. I am Dr. Heather Trafigan. I am an optometrist. I own Full Spectrum Family Vision Care in Cape Coral. The human eye is amazing, and it is very complex. Light enters the eye through the cornea, which is the front window to the eye. The light is then transferred through the pupil and bends or refracts at the lens, and then focuses on the retina. The retina is composed of millions of light-sensing cells. We call them rods and cones. Those rods and cones take the light and transfer it into electrical impulses. Then they are transmitted to the optic nerve, which sends it to the brain to create an image. There are many different types of eye diseases. The most common can be cataract, glaucoma, age-related macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy. People can also have dry eyes, floaters, pink eye. Um, then, then there's also refractive issues like nearsightedness, farsightedness, stigmatism. So yearly annual vision checkups are important for preventative health care. We can actually detect diabetes, high blood pressure, and cholesterol issues by looking inside the eye. And many vision problems are actually not detected um, with any symptoms or signs from patients. So you can have an issue without being aware of it. And early detection and treatment is important to prevent vision loss. 2020 is a term that we use to detect the clarity and sharpness of an object at a distance of 20 feet. So if you have 20-20 vision, then you see clearly what you're supposed to at that distance of 20 feet. If you have 20-100 vision, generally you need to stand at 20 feet to see the same thing that someone that has normal vision can stand at 100 feet. There are so many processes involved and if it does not line up properly, you're not gonna see properly. And if there's something wrong health-wise, it's not gonna allow you to focus. So the, the eye has many muscles that help it converge and move around, six muscles in each eye, and then internal muscles that help you focus. And then all the millions of nerve cells that accept that light and transmit it to the brain. With being an optometrist, I do feel like I help patients see better, obviously, and giving them that gift to be able to go out and do what they need to do in the world. And it's just very rewarding when I've prescribed some glasses or contact lenses for a patient and they're just so excited when they can actually see better with it. And we had a little six-year-old boy that we put glasses on him. I mean, he was just so excited. I can see, I can see, I can see. And we were all with tears. And just it felt very rewarding for everybody in the office. So it's just, um, it's a blessing to be able to help someone health-wise to make sure their eyes remain healthy and that um, we can help that clarity of vision so they have that sharpness that they need. So there's your, your lesson. All of you are now eye doctors. Um, I want to thank Dr. Heather again for doing that for us. You see, Heather and her team 
work really hard to help people see by offering vision care that includes regular checkups, and they check for diseases and, and treat it, and uh, their job is to help our physical sight. And one of the things that George had diagnosed a few years ago were the, were the, he has the floaters, these ghostly little blobs that move in and out of your, his line of sight, and uh, sometimes they can be very bothersome, and George shared with us that a few days ago he was in Switzerland walking along a lake, and he kept swatting away at gnats that weren't there, so people probably thought he was going crazy, and, but Heather's diagnosis put him at peace that he knew that he wasn't going crazy. And our purpose for this series, uh, 2020 Vision, is it's a four-week spiritual vision checkup for those of us who follow Jesus, and particularly those who call Grace Church our spiritual home. Now, during these weeks, like Dr. Heather and her team did for Pastor George, we hope that we're going to create a safe place for a deep and genuine spiritual vision exam. And for us individually as Christ followers and for those of us who call Grace Church our spiritual home, the aim of this series is to help us get an honest and accurate assessment of our spiritual vision. Hebrews 12, 2a challenges us with this simple yet profound words that says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. So how are we doing at living with our focus on Jesus? How are we as a congregation doing at fixing our eyes on Jesus alone? And what disease or distractions or floaters are getting in our way from focusing on on Jesus. The Bible has many verses that have to do with sight and seeing, and, and I was actually amazed at how much vision and sight uh, it talks about in the Bible. But I'd like to focus on two. In Isaiah 35, 5a, the prophet Isaiah looks centuries into the future and gets an insight into the way the Messiah or rescuer would be. He, he writes, And when he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind. 700 years before Jesus was born, God was telling us that he would be an eye-opening rescuer. Now, in my own life, I can testify to this eye-opening capacity of Jesus. The, The night I said yes to Jesus, the lights came on for me because I was lost and I had lack of purpose. And I had no vision in my life at all. And I could really see spiritually for the first time in my life. And salvation and healing and deliverance began. And my future and my calling increasingly became more clear the the longer I walked with Jesus. And the light of the world was the light of my life. And since that night, Jesus has kept Uh, opening my eyes to the the desperate need for him. And he recently, Jesus uh, has been inviting me into a a deeper and more intimate relationship with him and God. And the light keeps increasing in my life. And so a second verse I looked at this week about vision comes from Jesus' most famous message, the, the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus speaks about vision here too. Matthew uh, I love the way that ma- the message translates this, this verse from Matthew 6, 22 through 23. It says, Jesus said, Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. And when your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. You know, Jesus says that every one of us has spiritual eyes and that we're either wide open or or we're we're squinting a little bit. So here, like Dr. Heather did for George a few weeks ago, Dr. Jesus is going to see us today and do a spiritual eye exam. And he's asking us to open our eyes wide 
And are we focused on the light or the darkness? What are we looking at? And it could be you're here today and you're, you're a lot like I was those years ago. Maybe you need an eye-opening light of Jesus. You might be wondering about who Jesus is and what he could do in your life. And I'd invite you to simply ask Jesus to reveal himself to you. So here's the deal. God has been seeking after you your entire life. And I like the wisdom of Sam Shoemaker, and that might help us here, surrendering as much of yourself as you can to as much of God as you understand. Risk asking God to open your eyes to him. And here's what I can promise you. He wants to illuminate his love to you. And he has, his love is so much. Now, for those of you that are already on a journey following Jesus, and particularly those of you who call Grace Church your spiritual home, we're going to spend the next four weeks of spiritual visions in this series teaching what we call the discipleship path at Grace Church. And after more than 20 years, we've discovered about that through each of our journeys with God is unique and distinct with that both Scripture and experience confirms some commonness in our spiritual journey. So let me quickly review here. First, there was a time when we did not know God and someone came into our lives who reached us with the love of God. And they either in a moment or a season, we got connected to Jesus and again to either in a moment or over time we got connected to the body of Christ, the church. Then we begin a lifelong journey of being formed into the character of Jesus. And we learned how to pray and read the Bible and serve and other things that help us grow to love God. Then somewhere along the journey we discovered that God was sending us into our community and into the world to share God's love with others. And this path is common to almost every Christ follower. And yes, the details may be in a, even in a different kind of an order, but the phases seem common. Now remember, we want you to remember what God's vision for Grace Church is. It is to partner with God in transforming people from unbelievers to fully devoted disciples of Jesus to the glory of God. So for the next four weeks, we're going to consider how every Christ follower who calls Grace Church their spiritual home can partner with God in his work. And this is a checkup of our annual evaluation of our spiritual vision. As a church, we want to have 2020 vision when it comes to this. And if we fail at this, then we uh, fail at the most important thing. So let's look at how we're doing at, at joining Jesus in reaching our neighbors with the love of Jesus. Since we each play a part, we're making it personal with this question, how can I partner with God in helping people see Jesus? And this is our individual ministry as a Christ follower and corporate as the body of Christ to enrich ministry. And I think we would all agree that we, we often uh, see people who do not yet know Jesus and are seeing distorted views of Jesus, whether it's Jesus and politics or Jesus and prosperity gospel. You know, the, you know, follow Jesus and everything is going to be healthy, wealthy and wise in your life. And the Jesus of the four biographies is often not really seen. So to help us be more clearly and authentically help people see Jesus, the teaching team went on a, for a generic description of Jesus' ministry found in Matthew 9. We discovered two simple ways to help people, especially people who are far from God, see Jesus clearly. First, Graciously declare the goodness of Jesus. Matthew 9, 35a says, 
Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. So in your notes, you might want to circle the words teaching and announcing. And both of these words have to do uh, with the words that come out of Jesus' mouth. And scholars call it the reaching and preaching ministry of Jesus. Because we think of Jesus preaching and his announcing the good news of God's plan to fix our sin-sick planet. Through Jesus' death, burial, and glorious resurrection... And for Jesus teaching us how to live as followers of Jesus, when Jesus preached, he, he wore a prophet's hat, and when he taught, he wore a rabbi's hat. Now, I don't know if you've figured this out or not, but people don't always agree about what Jesus announced and taught. And I'm not naive or simplistic about this, but here's what I wonder. I might... Might the world be more interested if we as followers of Jesus uh, focused on dealing with the simple good news? I mean, here's the simple good news. God loves, not hates people. He wants all people to be delivered from hell now and, and later. And grace is ridiculously free and boggles the mind. And another thing that might help us as Christ followers is to declare the good news of Jesus like it is good news. I love Paul's warning in Colossians 4 uh, verses 5 through 6. It says, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that we'll have the right response for everyone. Paul advocates For followers of Jesus to be wise in both lifestyle and words. And the New Living Translation says the kind of conversations we have with people who do not believe as uh, gracious and attractive. And the Greek word is eratimonos and it literally means seasoned. Like you'd season something with salt. Now we all know that food is kind of tasteless if you don't put the spices in but we also know what food is like if it's overly salted. It's, it's, not, it's not good either. So this is why I'm convinced that the old hippie, hit you upside the head with the Bible verses is not the best way to share the good news with people. How about we simply share Jesus' love? And I love the old him and it says it best I love to tell the story of unseen things above of Jesus and his glory of Jesus and his love I love to tell the story because I know it's true it satisfies my longings as nothing else can do I mean that'll preach right there and this is my, one of my son's favorite hymns and, and uh, I made sure to play this a lot while he was in the Marines. So here's, here's the deal. Paul can disagree, or people can disagree with your theology. But they can't disagree with your testimony. So tell it. Let me tell you a dirty little secret about Grace Church. For a bunch of years, we've been videotaping and putting our worship services online for people to watch later. And we're, we're live on Facebook right now. But this includes uh, the messages that Pastor George preaches or Pastor Wes or Pastor Patty up in Sarasota. And, of course, for me, Sunday morning here, as well as the testimonies from uh, Fridays and Monday nights at Choose Recovery. And what has surprised and, frankly, wounded the hearts of our pastors is like four people watch one of my messages but like more than 2,800 watch our bass player, Mike. Now, after my childish jealousy dissipated, I knew in my heart 
that it's because what moves people is the story of change. And the best way to declare the goodness of Jesus is to declare how good he has been to you. So, the second way to partner with God in helping people to see Jesus is to generously demonstrate the goodness of Jesus. Matthew 9:35b says and he healed every kind of disease and illness. And in your message notes you can underline that word healed. Because biblical scholars agree that Jesus' ministry can be put into one of three brackets, preaching ministry, Jesus' teaching ministry, or Jesus' healing ministry. And the first two are declarations, while the third is a demonstration. And for the gospel to be full gospel, for the good news to fully embody the good news of Jesus, it needs both declaration, our words, and our demonstration, our deeds. Words without deeds is hollow, and deeds without words is shallow. And I've said it before, many of you have heard the old saying attributed to St. Francis, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Well, there's two problems with that. St. Francis didn't say it, and I don't believe he would have said it because he was both a declarer and a demonstrator of the goodness of Jesus, and so should we be. The healing ministry of Jesus is something for all followers of Jesus. Just like Jesus, preaching and teaching ministry is for all of us. His healing ministry is for all of us. Last week I was, I wasn't here. I was with Pat out at DeSoto Correctional Institute where Pat led a Kairos weekend and our team went in and ministered to 18 brothers in blue. And one of whom, at the closing, he, he got up there and he took off his glasses. And he said, this is how it was when I came in here. I couldn't see. But then he put his glasses back on and said, now I see clearly. Amen. Now I can see. And it's not that our team was special in any way. It was the presence and the power of our healing God. And when we show up and do Jesus' healing ministry as a bunch of cracked pots that Jesus shines his light through, we are a bunch of limping, walking, wounded people who usher people closer to Jesus, the healer. And in the words of D.T. Niles, it says, one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And around Grace Church, the good news shows up and shows off. We call those glory sightings. So here's the deal. When you make yourself available to join Jesus in his healing ministry, you get an all-access pass to God's glory. So listen, friends, you, Jesus still heals today. And he can not only heal broken bodies, but he can heal and restore weary minds, sagging souls, fractured relationships, and devastated finances. Anytime you risk joining a ministry team around here, especially those that reach out to our neighbors, you step into Jesus' healing ministry. It's in our Get Connected booklet, and there's some in the, in the back wall out there. So I invite you to take one home today and pray about what God might want you to join, where he might be able to use you in his healing ministry. When Matthew penned his version of the life of Jesus and described Jesus' threefold ministry of preaching, teaching, and healing, he also gave us the following insight about Jesus' heart and a few of Jesus' words that can help us. Matthew 9 Verses 36 through 38. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his field. And what motivated Jesus 
preaching, teaching, and healing reach ministry in Grace Church words here was a deep-seated compassion. I mean, from his gut, heartbrokenness that motivated him to help people. And he described people then, and I'd agree there are people like that now, like a sheep without a shepherd. So this week as I went into the fellowship hall on Wednesday, I felt the Holy Spirit in there, of course. As I stood in the back and I saw the many faces, and I could sense a lot of loss, a lot of emptiness, a lot of brokenness in some lives. From those that even had resources and drove cars there and then drove home to the people that had nothing in their pocket and went to the streets that night and everyone in between. So many seem to be like a sheep without a shepherd. And I could imagine Jesus weeping over over us as he weeps over his lost sheep. In Matthew's biography, Jesus speaks after his description to the first century uh, disciples then and and the 21st century disciples now. In Matthew 9, 37, Jesus says, The harvest is great, but the workers are few. Jesus sees the crowds, and now he sees the potential for harvest. I mean, a bumper crop. He calls it great. And the issue has been that the harvest is, is, is there's nothing problem with the harvest. It's the possibility of experience. The love of Jesus is so great What's the problem is that there are few workers. I think what this means is Jesus is out there at work in the world already. But he's looking for followers to come and join him in his work. Jesus ends with Matthew 9, 38. It says, so pray to the Lord who is in charge For the harvest, ask him to send more workers into his fields. Jesus invites us to pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and to ask him to awaken and hasten and move more of us to join him in his work. I'm going to invite the band to come back up. But here's a takeaway for you today because I know most everybody has one of these with them. Mine shut off, as you may notice, but I know everybody has one of these. Since we just read Matthew 9, 38, I'm going to ask you if you would set your alarm on your phone for either 9, 38 or a.m. or it could be 9, 38 p.m., either one or maybe both. And when that alarm goes off, I'm going to ask you to join Jesus and praying for more Christ followers to join him in the harvest work, declaring and demonstrating the goodness of Jesus. Friends, there is broken and helpless people out there, friends of ours that desperately are longing to see the goodness of Jesus. He said, The harvest is great, but the workers are few. Where might you join Jesus in healing? Another way we join Jesus is by celebrating Holy Communion with Him. We do this on the first of the month. And this is where we get to join Jesus in a healing ministry. Because this whole thing here, He did for our healing. He did for us. This was about him going to the cross for us. And on the night that he was betrayed by his friends, he took bread. He broke it. He gave it to them. And he said, take and eat this. This is my body. 
which is broken for you and for many. Take this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. And once again, he gave thanks. And he gave it to them and said, drink this. This is my blood poured out for you and many for the forgiveness of sins. That healing that we're talking about. So I'm going to invite you as the band plays to come, take a piece of bread, dip it into the juice. We use juice around here because we know that people struggle with something, you know, harder. Dip it in the juice, then take it to yourself. We invite you to spend some time at the altar in prayer. But I'm going to invite you to stand. Let's worship together and come as you feel the Spirit lead. Mm -hmm.